I've been asking, what does it, what does finishing strong mean? What does it look like for the Penn State Nittany Lions? I think we figured it out. I think we saw what it was today. Uh, a dominant win, 42 to nothing over Michigan State. Uh, but not just the win, not just the point total. We've seen them score more points than this in a football game, and it hasn't looked this complete. This was possibly the most complete game other than maybe the Michigan State game, or excuse me, the uh, Maryland game earlier this year. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. Welcome to the BWI Live Post Game Show. Your thoughts coming up on the show today. Uh, we'll also be joined by Nate Bauer in just a little bit. He has to do some things for the site, but he wanted to join the show for this uh, one final ride here into the sunset for the BWI Live post game show for the regular season. Don't worry, we'll be back for the bowl game uh, to give you all kinds of post game analysis of whomever Penn State matches up with. But uh, we're here for one final time here uh, at the end of the regular season and just under the buzzer. Just under the bell, Penn State gets in a really quality performance from the offense. Um, something that, you know, after the last game, after the Rutgers game, these are the frustrations I had is you, you were hoping to see um, a, a definite change and you were never going to get this type of game dominance against Rutgers. But you were hoping to see some signs of life from the passing game. 17-26, 292 yards and two touchdowns from Drew Aller looking competent, and confident and poised in the pocket. It helps when the... I, actually, I stopped myself. I almost said there's no pressure. There was little pressure in the second half, but there was pressure early in the game. Some issues, once again, with protections. Once again, some issues with, um, I'd say, the, the called play versus a cover zero blitz where there wasn't a quick out, there wasn't a quick answer based on the way Michigan State played uh, in the low red zone, running a cover zero blitz uh, to prevent a touchdown. But Penn State bounced back from that, and they got, uh, they got a really good performance from their offense. Everything clicked. Both running backs went over 100 yards. Everyone's happy today. And I don't just mean Penn State fans. I mean, Nick Singleton is happy. Uh, Katron Allen is happy. Those guys combined for like four, 300 yards, pretty close. When you add in uh, the receptions as well, Catron Allen, uh, three catches for 17 yards. Nick Singleton, two for 68. He also had 118 yards rushing. So these guys are accounting for a lot of yards. Penn State racked up almost 600 yards in the game. They scored at least 10 points in three quarters. That's uh, other than, you know, I wouldn't even say a slow start, just a non-scoring start. They had a very good beginning to the game. We're having a very good beginning to the show here. Lots of people filing in. I am so happy that you're here because there was a very real possibility, uh, unless Penn State lost this game, that everyone's going to be like, you know, that was great. It's time to go to bed. Uh, but you guys are here. I love it. If you have friends and family around for the holidays, hope you're sharing Blue White Illustrated with them and here on the post game show. Kenneth Coral said, we didn't run the T formation. We didn't just run the T formation in the red zone. Yes, the offense evolved and adapted. The offense looks different, and it's all last minute. Can't wait to see the new offensive coordinator hire. A couple of different thoughts in there, Kenneth. Uh, yeah, it, it, this is, like I said uh, just a second ago, this is what you were hoping that Penn State would be able to do um, if they're going to make a change. If you're going to make a change, the problem is the offense was stuck in neutral the whole year. Get it out of neutral, but Rutgers is a good defense, and this kind of, th I think, shows the difference last week to this week, what the plan was going to be before Drew Aller got hurt. I thought it was really interesting. We heard a lot about Bo Perbula coming into this game. We would see a lot of Bo Perbula. Bo Perbula is going to play. Both quarterbacks are going to play. They did. Bo Perbula, uh, two passes and uh, one run. So not nearly as much as it was advertised, but still you got to see Bo Perbula in the game. So I think a judicious use of all of their talents. And the main thing to me, talking about this game from a tactical standpoint and some of the things I'm noticing from the offense in these two weeks to finish the season strong is they're targeting their best players. Um, you have six targets to Theo Johnson. Dante Cephas has four. And then Tyler Warren has five. So... Uh, that I think is really interesting when you look at the target distribution and how they're using certain players. Uh, the receiver is being used to uh, run off and open up some zones for the tight ends, and it worked. 
some of the things that Penn State was doing before is they were trying to get Tyler uh, Warren and Theo Johnson open in the ways that they're getting open now, but the way Penn State is doing it is different. They're using them from the same side of the field to get into those zones. So here, I'll try to explain something that I maybe isn't super complex, but without visuals might be hard to understand. So in cover three, you've got three primary zones in deep coverage. Two corners and a safety is usually how it is, but it doesn't have to be. So you have you have to take care of one of those corners. So the, the receivers are running down the field, you know, go routes, to A, hopefully get a big play. You know, they are a part of the pass read, but primarily they are taking that corner out of the coverage there. And instead of running somebody from the other side of the field on a deep crosser, like Mike Yersich used to do, Penn State's taking the tight ends from the same side of the field and Keandre Lambert-Smith, his big play, from the same side of the field and running a post corner or a post out route and attacking underneath that zone from this instead of taking longer to get there having it a shorter distance so they're bringing guys from the same side of the field attacking in, in a flood uh pattern to that outside of a cover three cover four if you want in, in certain situations but i think it's just a, a smart way that they have augmented the passing game to put some uh more uh, i think ease of use for the offense and for the offensive skill players and it helps tight ends <laughs> you know it's easier for theo, for theo johnson to run up five yards and then cut twice than it is for him to sprint across the field also when you do that you're you have the potential to bring other defenders with you across the field so uh, a couple of tweaks there the running game like we said i think is pretty um it's pretty consistent from what they've been doing previously uh, this season, but they have a wrinkle here. They have a wrinkle there. Like the, uh, I, I put this out on, on Twitter. I'm still going to call it Twitter. Sorry. I take a long time to adapt, but, um, they, they ran from not the pistol and not the shotgun. So they had their cowboy backfield with two tight ends and Nick Singleton went from the pistol behind the quarterback to behind, I think Theo Johnson, like a step behind him, some bastardized formational, oddity and i loved it because i don't know what to call it i don't know what it is but it was fun uh it was uh the, just little tweaks they here and there and all obviously the the most important thing here is michigan state is not a good team they were looking for a, an out here in this game um it was they, they fought through it early but were not able to really put together a uh, a real threat outside of a couple of drives. And we're going to get to all of that with Nate Bauer. He's joining us in just one moment. But first, we have to talk about the Penn State defensive line. And by that, I mean uh, hand fighting. They, they didn't need to use as much this week because they were just faster than the uh, Michigan State tackles. But if you want to become, if you're a football player, you're a high school football player, and you want to take your game to the next level and maximize your abilities, MMA FX is for you. Do you have a son or a football team that wants to get an edge on the football field? Every split second, every moment, every movement in the game matters. So train like the best by training with the best. MMA FX is the hand fighting course taught by Bruce Lombard at Lombard MMA uh, here in State College. But he's created a video tutorial that you can use to teach your high school football team. It's the off season. It's a very important time for growth and development. So get into the lab right now. Use these hand fighting techniques to be better with your non-dominant hand to create separation. Because the best way to defeat a block is to make it pretty much useless. To defeat a block is the best way to defeat a block instead of trying to run through a person. So get the MMA FX videos, 25 techniques, 60 drills, four levels of difficulty, making the aim of you a better football player. The system benefits primarily defensive linemen, linebackers, and wide receivers. He does have other programs specifically tailored to offensive linemen because that is a very different thing. We've seen both of those things. Go to MMAFX.net today to learn more or Bruce at MMAFX.net. <laughs> Nate Bauer joining us. Nate, what did you think of that game? Oh, boy. T. Frank. I can't believe I'm here, first of all. <laughs> Welcome. This is like a, I'm this so is like, excited to have you here. Yeah, this is, like a, this is like a secret world that I'm being invited into. I love it. I love it. What's going on? Uh, we were just, I was, I, I, this game, I think, is the most complete game Penn State has played all year. From offense, defense, explosive plays. Everything finally happened under the gun. Yep. I know they've put up better point totals. Maybe you could make the argument Aller was better against Michigan. Or, I did it twice. 
did it twice Maryland. Named Maryland than he was in this game. Yep. Um, this is uh, this to me was the the best performance. And Greg, Greg Fischel's YouTube channel's back. He says this is not the night to focus on the two losses. Rather, phenomenal performance tonight. So people are happy, Nate. Mm -hmm. Am I? Where do we say that Michigan State wasn't very good tonight? Is that? Do I get you the... fold it, you fold it in here and there. It's like mixing a cake batter. It's like here are the chocolate chips. You fold it in and then you get a little bit of Michigan State secondary is bad and then Ooh. you know and then you <laughs> and you bake the cookies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. HF transplant says going to bed. Have to be up in five hours. We'll watch tomorrow. Always love the post game shows. Thank you, by the way, to everybody who's been here for these. That is, I, I told everyone Nate that uh, after this particular game. Maybe you had leftovers and you fell asleep at 1045. I wouldn't buy, I wouldn't, I would not uh, blame you, but we've yeah. got a great crowd tonight here to talk about Penn State, Michigan State. I just, I just started uh, arguing with people on the message boards. Once, uh, once it got to that point in the game, it was just like, <laughs> you know what, <laughs> let's loop back and find some of the stupid things that people said last <laughs> week and really double down on them. Let's get yeah. back into it. Um, no, but look. Uh, Drew Drew Aller had a great game. Uh, mm -hmm. Nick Singleton had had a really nice game. Catron Allen that fifty yard carry in the first half I thought really set the tone. Yep. Uh, and and look like my initial takeaway was okay. We're all going to focus on the offense because Penn State's offense took strides. It, it's so clear, right? It's just yes. Uh, it was an evolution for for Penn State's offense and. Uh, something that needed to happen and, and wasn't something that happened earlier in the season. But, but it's a lot different when you can play a game where there are no repercussions for mistakes. And the avenue for that to exist is Penn State's defense destroying souls, just, <laughs> just murdering people. Uh, let's, I mean, it, let's show this in, in detail. Because I love doing this, Nate. You're you're getting the full tour of the post game show. We're gonna we're gonna show the box score and we're gonna point out 68 yards, 68 yards allowed. That's ridiculous. These are no. people that do this for like you know this is what they do. They do football and they only got 68 yards in this game. I said I said, that said something in the first half. Uh, I mean, I was concerned for Hauser, right? Like, uh, it was a legitimate concern for for Michigan State's quarterback uh, that he was not being put in positions to protect himself uh, against a, a Penn State defense that was just it was it was more than suffocating. It was like vicious, yeah. uh, right? I mean, just just the hits. I mean, we do I do a in game thing where I go through. Uh, you know, best hit and best sack and like all that stuff. I mean, there, there wasn't enough space, right? And that's on yeah. the internet. So that's saying something, uh, <laughs> you know, there's just, there was just too much um, uh, in terms of Penn State's dominance defensively. And it really was, you know, I, I mean, all, all the stuff that you can say about complimentary type games, this was that, um, you know, Penn State, Penn State did it. Ted Wimsat says this was a feel good game. I think it's important, Nate. Uh, I've been, I know I've been haranguing on this and people are probably tired of hearing me say this, but if you made this decision to move on from your offensive coordinator, there are two worlds that can exist. The first is um, things you just limp to the finish, right? Yep. And you just need to get out of this season and then you get into bowl practice and you can, whatever happens to the bowl game, but you'll have more time to prepare. You'll have more time to make a plan. Even if you don't have a guy in the building that you necessarily think is a strong candidate as a, as a in-game coordinator, like a play caller, or you can unstick, you can unplug it and plug it back in and it can work. And that's the thing I think against the Rutgers defense I was so frustrated with was um, the end of that game there was no passing. There was no idea of, Hey, is this yep. getting any better? Do we have a better concept? And then when you go back and you watch the first half, you go, okay, there's some good stuff here. They're fighting through adversity against a good Rutgers defense. And here you just get to see all of the things that they wanted to do. As, as Ted says, what could have been glad to see Singleton and others smiling at the end. Um, putting, I, I think one of the main things people want to talk about is putting Nick Singleton in position to succeed. What did you think about that tonight? I mean, the, the, the first big play that he had, right. was in the passing game getting it to him in you know uh right there at the edge at the sideline uh, yeah it it 
look, I, I am a firm proponent of not doing revisionist history. And so some of the stuff that Penn State did offensively this year that Mike Yersich is rightfully criticized for mm -hmm. is is harder to do in the moment than it is to critique it afterwards. That that's like that's the only place that I'm going to come from on this is it is it is a lot easier to see uh, this stuff work tonight against a defense that was not up to snuff right to, to handle yeah. some of this stuff right yeah. it's just it's just different it's just a different conversation um you know in terms of what you think is the best plan of attack for ohio state and michigan not yeah. working right as, as opposed to this so i i think that there's a, a middle ground to be had as always right that's what i do yeah. is, is find a middle ground but certainly uh in terms of obvious ramifications or dividends like i mean nick singleton's face beaming right it's right. just like jumping through the screen you can see how much it meant to him palpable, to be able to have this type of energy palpable relief just a release he's a very emotional dude you see that you know even if it's kind of an under the surface sort of boiling kettle thing He's clearly somebody that cares and deeply has all of these emotions. And when he was succeeding tonight and finally getting out and finally getting free, all of it came to the surface. And it was it was cathartic, I think, for people watching him who have watched him all year to have him have that moment. Sam says backups got a lot of snaps on D, especially at linebacker. I feel like the drop off may not be as big as we thought. Thanks for all your hard work, uh, all your work this season. I added the hard in there because I'm given. Uh, but us. it is. Yeah, no, you work hard. <laughs> uh, I, I, I guess I disagree with the middle part of the. I never expect the drop off to be huge, especially exactly. linebacker. Uh, Abdul Carter and Kobe King are coming back. You got Dom DeLuca, Tony Rojas. I agree that Tony Rojas, the, the, the backups at the end of the game were getting the same negative plays that the starters were. And Tony Rojas always looks good. So I, I just think that, you know, they're in such a great position for that, the front seven, I'd say, next year. It's it's such a strange... I, I, like, I just don't know that there's any sport quite like college football in the, the tendency to want to look ahead, right? I mean, they, yeah. they, they, st they still <laughs> well, have a you bowl. Have not been, you're not a fan of an NFL team that sucks. That's fair. draft season starts in October for those people. That's a reformed fair. draft a holic. That's fair. But you're but right. It, you're right. Right. It's it's. I mean, the whole the whole conversation right now is, uh, you know, uh, post chop, right? Post yeah. Uh, post Manny, which I, I think. I mean, I'm. I don't want to guarantee anything, but I think that there is a very good chance that he comes back to, to Penn State next year. I think that's a real possibility uh, of having Manny Diaz back as as defensive coordinator next year and look regardless uh there is evidence throughout James Franklin's tenure and certainly before that that this is a program that values tough defense they have the players in the program uh, whether they are the current players or the ones that are coming up right guys who who didn't get a ton of run this year, but obviously showed flashes. Jameel Lyons, right? Like mm -hmm. there, there are, there is that next wave that, uh, that that Penn State has in place that I think bodes very, very well uh, for what they're going to be next year. But hey, also they won tonight and get a bowl game against potentially a very, very relevant, right? Like it, there is an opportunity still for Penn State to have a relevant, meaningful bowl game against a team that matters and yeah. get up this program, which it so desperately needs a win against a not a top one or two team, but a yeah. win against a, a an eighth ranked team. Yeah. Right? Like they, they desperately it's either need that. one or two or 30 that they play on their schedule. Yeah, well, there's no in between. I mean, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't help but sit and marvel at the notion that Iowa will represent the Big Ten West. You, and, right? That's you a, beat me to the punch there. It was the first thing I said when I was like, "No, that's not true," because Iowa exists, and that's also sad.
<laughs> but but look, we, we are we are uh, there's a new frontier that is coming to college football next yeah. year, right? And and very much in the Big Ten, very much with the college football playoff, it it will all change next season. And some of this stuff that is legacy nonsense is, is going away, and it will all be for the better. Uh, in in a lot of ways, in terms of, I'm not saying necessarily for Penn State, but for the game to be able to sort out who is good and who isn't. Because yeah. guess what, Iowa still isn't very good. <laughs> Penn State <laughs> is decently good. Yeah, yeah, right. Just just not as good as the top two. It, it, interesting. I, I I'll get to this now. Uh, we got to, there's something I want to tell everybody here in just a second, but Larry had this up here and I, I just think this is interesting. Co-offensive coordinators got the offense rolling in two weeks. Mike Gersich couldn't do it in 10, uh, an elite offense coordinator. This offense will soar bowl season next hashtag. We are that was the, again, shout out to Larry. He's a regular here on the post game show. Always love having him here. Uh, and he has r really thoughtful comments for the most part. This one is, is more statement, uh, big picture statement. This is something I said in the pregame show, and I'm curious, like, they got to get this offense rolling uh, next year because the mm -hmm. opportunity presents itself, right? So mm -hmm. there's an opportunity next year with the defense potentially still being at the same level as we talked about with Sam. Do you think that they can turn it around quickly knowing they're going to lose four-fifths of their offensive line? They need to do a lot of work in the portal at receiver, but uh, you got to reload at tight end. You feel optimistic about that generally, but you don't know. They're... Is it is it too little too late with this offense with the pieces that it has or was it is it I don't even know what I'm asking you it just seems like the optimism of this game makes you feel like it was always there for the last 10 11 weeks and 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 can they can they take this bottle this feeling that I was talking I about finishing know. strong and keep going because that's don't that's tough to me with with the personnel change there don't you think that drew aller tonight is a different human than the one that played at illinois in september i yeah. do yeah i do and so you know i just think that people have an opportunity to get better i i think that nick singleton that played tonight is better than the one that played earlier this season and and i'm not even saying like i i very strongly believe that some of the troubles that he had or challenges that he had this season and Katron, right? I mean, neither one of those guys were breaking off. There is a reason that tonight was the first time that either one of them had a carry over 40 yards, right? Yeah. It, which was a huge departure from last season. It's because defenses were hell bent on taking that away from them. And they yeah. did that successfully. But over time, Drew becomes a better quarterback. Uh, the passing game is more potent uh, and and they are able to take advantage of some of like Dante Cephas, getting Dante and Dante Cephas involved at the very beginning of that game, yeah. uh, using the tight ends more that there were avenues there that helped loosen that up for those running backs to get going. And the running backs helped themselves in the passing yeah. game. If there's one thing, Nate, that I think uh, that they've done that I've liked is they've stopped force feeding Keandre Lambert Smith. It felt totally. like they were they were bending over backwards to try and make wide receiver one get into a rhythm instead of trying to get the offense to function and work within the parameters of this is what we want to do and we need to get some completions and not just get completions uh down the field or in specific situations different. It just feels like the offense is not trying to flow in one direction. It's flowing where the ball should go. Um and where you should go is where you're going to have the most fun. And it's the off season almost. We still got to get through the, this post game wrap up and the football's never really truly done. But if you've got you know, some holiday plans, maybe you want to get to the bowl game. Uh, I think you should check out Game Time. Game Time is a uh, ticket app, especially download the Game Time app, but I'm going to show you their website so you can see some of the things you can get. Uh, it's hockey season, so if you live regionally here, you want to go see the Leafs at the Penguins, uh, you can get tickets uh, from game time. And the, the things that I've found that I think are super awesome about game time is uh, th they've got flash deals, so you can get great deals on tickets. If you're a person that likes to roll the dice, Nate, gamble and uh, try and buy your tickets last minute, they have last minute deals. 
and you won't ever get fleeced because they give you an image of your seats so you know what you're paying for. Lowest prices guaranteed, even cancellation protection and job loss protection, all these things on their tickets. So if you want to check out uh, Game Time, it's the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. So download the Game Time app. This is where I got to go find my info. Download the Game Time app because this is important. It gets you money. Um, mm. Use promo code BWI for $20 off your first purchase. GameTime.co is the uh, website here, but also make sure you get the app and you download that as well because that's most people do everything on their phone. I'm just a dinosaur and I use my computer, Nate. And I like peace of mind when buying tickets when I get to leave the house, which isn't often, but right. I'm working. I was going to ask you: Are you a concert person or shows? What do you do? What do you like to go to? I like dinner at this point, but. Uh... <laughs> anywhere you can get out of the house t frank let me let me tell you something buddy the the first time that you go to dinner at 5 30 on a friday and it's like feels pretty normal that's when things fall apart for you it's 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 just a sad reflection of adulthood but no i love concerts i like concerts i like comedy shows i like it all i'm a man of the people that's what i do I like that game time they sort by category and i don't see this is the thing nate i i, I told fitz this I don't leave my house. Like I'm in this room all the time. This is where I, this is exactly, you think like, oh, uh, I'm joking. No, I sit here 60% of the time and then I just go and I eat food in the other everybody's, room. Everybody's, everybody's watching this and they're like, these losers, <laughs> these total <laughs> I mean, Here's the problem is like, I have to sell this. I have to tell you about game time. And it's like, I think they do a great job. I've used the app before, but it's so infrequent because I'm a hermit. <laughs> Where both of us are like, man, that sounds like a really cool idea if I was a person who used something like that. KJ's back. He says another awesome season. Amazing coverage from uh, all you at Blue White Illustrated. Thanks for all you do. Easily the best place uh, for PSU coverage. I'm I'm not just reading the compliments, I promise you. Everyone's in a good mood, though, tonight, and I do appreciate everyone being here. If you've Why? got some questions, you got some thoughts, uh, you can put them in the chat. We're talking to you tonight. Nate is going to have to bounce at a certain point because uh, you know he has a, a big boy job of writing and putting his thoughts into a cohesive uh, narrative on a page, a virtual page, instead of just rambling for 60 minutes on the internet, which is what I do. So at some point he's going to have to get going. So we're, we're, I want to make sure you're a part of the show as well. James says Singleton looked like he was running angry tonight. He's been running angry for weeks. Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is we, we see what we want to see. Sometimes he hasn't had the cuts necessarily that he had tonight. I thought that, uh, he made some progress there in terms of, picking the right hole. I mean, particularly on the touchdown, but no, he's been, he's been running mad for a long time this season. Yes. I, I, I never really thought that that was in question. It's just that he, you got to see it happen. Like you got to see the angry because he broke through the line of scrimmage tonight. Our pass says there isn't a chance. There isn't a chance they keep, I believe this is a question. Is yep. there a chance they keep Ty Howell and Jay Wan Sider as offensive coordinators moving forward? Before you answer that, Nate, mm -hmm. I want to tell people, join Blue White Illustrated because you can get mm -hmm. more of the answer from Blue White Illustrated. There's a special offer just for you here on YouTube, a dollar for two months of access when you use the promo code PSU1. So Nate has been doing some work on the offensive coordinator search the names and not just the names, but also the situation. Um, and I want everyone to know, get all the information from him and fits at bluewhiteillustrated.com. Can you give him a morsel or two? Let him know it's there. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta pay for the good stuff guys. Um, <laughs> that said, I would, I would uh, morsel. I think this is a fair morsel is mm -hmm. I, my anticipation is not, for J1 and, and Ty to be the, the offense, either one of them to be the offensive coordinator moving forward. doesn't mean it can't happen. Certain, certainly mm -hmm. it can. I think that a uh, second morsel I'll give is that it's going to, it's going to ramp up, right? It's got the, the season being over uh, as of tonight means that tomorrow, Sunday, Monday, you name it, uh, you know, the actual act of going out and, negotiating, interviewing, all of that stuff for an offensive coordinator can actually happen in earnest. And I won't be surprised. I won't be surprised if uh, if they move quickly 
after that, right? It, it was, it's, okay. we, we've been kind of framing things as, uh, you, you know, nothing's got, nothing was going to happen before today. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't expect anything to happen until at least Monday next week, probably later than that. But also I don't expect this to drag on into the middle of December. I, I would be surprised if it takes that long. Well, I'm just going to get them the Blue White Illustrated live show schedule, you know, for the mm -hmm. off season so they can build in the decision around that so that it works out for everybody. That that would be best for me if they if they did it on Tuesday so we could just talk about it on the live show. That'd be that'd be phenomenal. Whatever works for you, T. Frank. Yes, we're building we're building everything around my schedule uh, for sure. Uh, what 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 stood out to you getting back to the game? What yeah. stood out to you about um, the way the first half played out? So, again, it's not just how the game ends. It's also how the game starts. What did you think about the the first half that led to the, what happened versus the second half and how things finally turned a corner and the yards turned into points? Yeah, it's, it's funny because it's uh, not all that much of a departure from previous storylines, right? Previous game narratives that we've seen this season. Illinois in the first half. Northwestern in the first half, Iowa in the first half of doing some good things. It wasn't like abject misery, but there were opportunities that Penn State wasn't able to capitalize on offensively that, you know, certainly there were a bunch of people at six, nothing having a 178 to 20 yard advantage in the first quarter, whatever that number was right yeah. in terms of yards gained in the first, the first, uh, the first quarter. But Hey, you, you, you keep tapping on that stone and eventually it's going to break. And that, that is what Penn state did. They, I thought, uh, you know, I'm beating a dead horse here, but Bo Prabula again, it's like there, there is an argument being had about whether or not he, it was an intentional usage of him and that Penn state only went to him once the game was comfortable and already secured. Yeah. No, they put, they put him in, at 13 nothing right? yeah. like i mean but well, first they didn't of all they put him in in the first couple drives they did a let i thought this was interesting because they did let drew establish himself in the game like they didn't go For right sure. in the first drive and then on the first third and short or any situation they they actually let the offense be the offense this i thought they did a great job of this because that was a big question is how are they going to run the offense and not have it be a two quarterback system and i thought they really actually nailed it this week it's just, it's just picking your spots. That's, that's always been the argument is picking your spots, finding places where it makes sense. Even I, I again, like I, I understand how this sounds, but I'm, I'm going to say it anyway, because it's true. Getting Michigan state to call a timeout by yes. him being in the game yeah. is a win. That's a, that's a win. That's a, that's a right. It, games are just series of reps. And you are trying to win as many of those as you possibly can. Talk and my language. Am, am I not? I, I, I love it. And, I, yes. and I'm an idiot. You're very smart, <laughs> T Frank. You, you understand this stuff way better than I do. But I'm just saying, like, that's that is a strategic win is to have him in the game and force a timeout. Uh, and then after the fact, they kept him in anyway and yeah. were able to do a couple different things with him, including throw for a touchdown right on a play where Michigan state very clearly was dialed in to stop him running the ball. Yeah. So I, I just think that once that happened and they got on the board, pushed it to 21, nothing, it, it di different things happen at different times. It, I'm it's on my brain because I watched a Penn state basketball game this afternoon mm -hmm. and dynamics of games are important and underrated parts of how we talk about what happens. Right. And so the, 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 the situation that teams are in, how you're able to perform given the circumstances, they change, they change. If you're trail, if you're constantly trailing, yeah, they, ch it changes the type of performance that you can have. Conversely, if you're ahead and feel very good about being ahead because you've got a defense behind you that is murdering people. It's so true. It changes things. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, I thought, I thought that, that if, if, you know, uh, again, to the stuff that 
James Franklin does that nobody likes, but preaches and it works more often than not being patient. Nobody lost their heads for Penn state about being up 13 to nothing. Yeah. That was not, they the also didn't world. freak out after the missed field goal. Sometimes nope. I feel like James Franklin has a, just a very short leech on field goal kickers. Um, but that obviously is more to do with practice and it being kind of a repetitive thing that Falcons, they didn't even blink when he f- missed his, that was his first miss of the year, uh, or, or not. Mm, I, I don't felt like he another missed, one. Yeah. I don't remember, but I felt like he missed one early, but it, you know, he makes a yeah. 49 yarder and then he comes back and, and misses one. It yeah. happens. YouTube user, <laughs> which by the way is like username here. Love this says, why keep drew on the field when Prabula is at quarterback? I think this is, there's a certain amount of intentionality that Drew never leaves the field. I feel like that is a statement because that's, that's a great point that why is Drew on the field? They, they brought it up on the, on the, on the broadcast as well. And I, that's something I thought about of like, okay, great. They, they had a corner over top of Drew and like, you have to tacitly acknowledge that there is an 11th player out there when you have your non-running quarterback lined up a receiver. That's why the Wildcat doesn't work because it it actually doesn't you don't provide the credible threats on other parts of the field in the traditional wildcat which is the quarterback is lined up at receiver just kind of away from the play um they blitz a corner and then keep a safety over top of like it it's like a daycare it's like a babysitter for the quarterback <laughs> like you just keep an eye on him make sure he doesn't need any glue like he's just going to be in the corner but to me it's more that Drew never comes off the field. Bo is a part of the offense, but this is Drew's offense. Isn't isn't the idea there, and, and I, I am happy to be educated and wrong about this, isn't the idea that you can motion Drew back into the backfield? If he's on the line of scrimmage, I don't know how they had him specifically lined up. These are the technical, if he's on the line of scrimmage, he will have to be off the line of scrimmage then and motion in. So it would matter... It would change who's eligible on the play if he was covering somebody up, etc. So I don't know exactly how he's lined up, but yes, he could theoretically motion in if you had him and another receiver to that side. But if no. it's just him on that side, he has to be covering up the tackle, or else somebody on the other side has to be ineligible. So it's a bunch of technicalities, and he's not a part of the play. <laughs> like for the most part, like yes, I understand uh, theoretically, yeah, but uh, it it doesn't it doesn't it's not conducive really to have drew out there to do anything other than a uh backwards pass you know might be time to uh to spend a question for for james franklin on a hypothetical of the benefit of yeah running that uh do you have any questions here in uh (laughs) this conversation is silly i agree i kind of think that it's it's silly uh but it is interesting that they they're they're trying to make it work like they're trying to make it work without going full tommy stevens lion it seems like to make Bo is a quarterback he's a running quarterback but we've seen him throw the football and they don't want to fully devolve him into like that athlete slash position um bruno bruno is is my guy Thank you for all your hard work during the season. Can Nate talk a bit about the possible bowl games? No, Nate, you do, do you have any idea of the bowl matchups? Is uh, who's do we no. know the likely teams? I saw Tulane at one point. Like what's, yeah, I what's mean, the I, likely bowl? Do we know the likely bowl? No, I okay. I mean uh, Peach Bowl was a possibility at one point. I I, I mean genuinely like there there is. Uh, the people that do the bowl predictions, maybe there's a science to it. I'm assuming they're talking to people. They have relationships. So, yeah, if Jerry Palm says that Penn State is going to the Peach Bowl or it looks like that. But I just think that there's enough football left to play. Also, and and this is part of, I, I don't know, like just something I kind of believe. It's in the law of things that will happen, right? Like mm-hmm. they will be in a bowl game. It will be announced next Sunday, not this yeah. Sunday, next Sunday. Uh, that that th- Those are things that are certain in life. So uh, we will find out. It, it, will, uh, it will be very interesting to see if New Year's Six is, mm-hmm. right, because there was some flirt- flirtation there with, with possibly being overtaken, right? There was some argument that uh, 
that Penn State didn't belong there in that 11th spot. But uh, mm-hmm. after this performance, I, I think it would be hard to see them slip out of that eligibility to, to have a New Year's Six spot. And, mm-hmm. you know, so uh, again, uh, let's get to the politics. Penn State sells well. They travel well. All of that yeah. stuff like that, that all Fiesta comes Bowl. into play. So I, I looked it up quickly. Fiesta Bowl and Peach Bowl are the top two in this particular article. So I guess those are not the Rose Bowl this year. Um, I, that might be a college football playoff game. It is a playoff uh, game. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So I think Fiesta Bowl makes sense. It's been a while since they've been there. Missouri and Tulane were their top uh, in this article. The uh, uh, Gathering all of those particular, Which... as you mentioned, bowl prognosticators. All the different bowl prognosticators. Mostly Missouri, Tulane, and I saw Washington in there as well. Which is just, it. it is, it is so fascinating to me because... None of those teams will be satisfactory to Penn State fans. If Penn State draws Tulane, if yeah. they draw Missouri, if they Missouri's draw Washington, good. I know that. I know that. <laughs> Washington was good in 2017. Yep. And Penn State a lot get... of NFL players on that team. Memphis was really good in 2019. Penn State yeah. gets no credit for winning those games. And so it 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 is purely a situation where I am eager in either direction because it's going to be crazy how people yeah. respond to the luck of either getting a blue blood or not. Yep. Eric has, a, has a, a wants to jump in the conversation here. Uh, he says, I find Drew, Drew way too conservative still in tight games, too afraid to make a mistake, but as the score piles up, he starts taking more shots. Mm-hmm. Um, I... That the I can't I can't hear this tonight. I can't hear this this detail this nuance after he had I think his best game of his career. Now he he threw more dimes against Maryland, but Maryland also was like, "Hey, we're gonna run this one coverage all game, just so you know, we're running this coverage or this coverage, and that's it." Michigan State was mixing things up. They play zone. They play man. They play some cover four. They do a bunch of different things. They're not good at any of those things, but they do present to you a tapestry of different coverages. So if this were a test, Nate, it had it was a multi-answer test. Mm-hmm. Instead of, hey, can you beat cover one? Can you beat cover zero? Which was a lot of what that game was. This game, he threw a ball into a tight window with his feet on his own end zone on his own goal line and threw it between two defenders to Tyler Warren for a first down to get him out of the shadow of their own goal posts. So Eric, I disagree. I think if you're looking for 72 yard touchdown plays, you have to call those. And those are not something that most offenses generate at a high clip, especially if you've got receivers that are not a part of the offense for the most part, you know? Um, Yes, I do want to talk about this, and I'm going to use this, Eric, as a jumping off point. Thank you, by the way, for the comment. Thank you for bringing this up because, Nate, that touchdown, uh, almost touchdown, I I just wanted it so badly to be a touchdown to Mario Evans because it is the same play as his second pass of his career. It just a full circle. Coming full circle, the same shot play they have run week one, week three, week six, week seven, the same play. And they hit it at the first game and the last game. Yeah, circle of life. Right? I find that so interesting. That was it. I just wanted to point that out, that it was the same play. (laughs) I mean, they have been thirsting for, for all of this stuff for a long time. Uh, it has not happened for one reason or another. But in the in the meantime, there there has been a team and a quarterback who excelled at again. I mean, I feel like a broken record, but like the unsexy stuff. He he, Aller finished with twenty three touchdowns to one interception in his first year as a starter. One interception on three hundred fifty yeah. pass attempts. Is it, that's that's really good. That's stupid. <laughs> like there's there's nobody else that's doing that. So I, you know, I, to to me it, it bodes very very well 
when you, if you can mesh those two, right? Because they're the same guy. There's th- that guy is in there. He, yeah. He's been in there the whole season. Uh, it's just a matter of getting a little bit better. I think certainly you're, you're going to have new looks from a new offensive coordinator, some new perspectives on uh, timing of play mm-hmm. calls, right? How play calls are made in the course of a game, not necessarily the nature of the plays themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, and and that's something James Franklin talked about. Play calling specifically was an issue for the offense this year, and I, and I thought the last two games, even with the way the game against Rutgers ended, there were a lot of really smart things. And I guess the 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 main thing I took away with uh, was they were doing similar things to what they were trying to do previously. I don't think Mike Yurcich's concepts were crazy or bad. Um, it was just that there was a lot of them. And as James Franklin talked about, like narrowing things down and making it so that you can play fast, they have looked faster on offense. Am I crazy? Or is that, you know, was that, did he, did he, uh, do a Jedi mind trick and plant that in my head where it looks like the offense is playing a lot faster than they were previously? I did not notice that, but I'm, I'm fine. If you did, I, (laughs) All right. Yeah. Um, sorry. Cu- couple I gotta other go. things. You gotta go. <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta so go. So does Kenneth. Yeah. Kenneth is uh, Kenneth is out too. Sounds like we're beating a dead horse at this point. Thanks for the analysis, guys. <laughs> sorry, All sorry, right. Kenneth. The, uh, <laughs> the 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 James Franklin post game is done, and I owe Greg a transcript. So I'm gonna go do that. All right. Thank you very much. That is Nate Bauer, a senior editor for Blue White Illustrated. Thank you so much for being here and talking to me on the post game show. That was Nate. Everybody, give him a round of applause. YouTube user says, "Were tight ends more involved tonight?" Yes, and I think that's the point: is that they were getting the tight ends involved. They were they were targeting that part of the offense and using those players to move the football. Um, and, and in critical situations, they were dialing up first read looks for those guys. They were also using uh, the you know, James Franklin talked about using the full part of the field, the full field to attack uh, the defense. They were able to put in enough plays early in the game uh, to attack with the run game. And that's another thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, Tyler Warren. Tyler Warren is developing into a really problematic player because uh, this game specifically, he had a key block that got the first explosive run from Catron Allen. Catron Allen's vision is awesome. We can get to that in just a second. But he got a great block in uh, zone blocking system, which he's been struggling with all year on the backside of the play. It's a critical play to get those cutback runs that you saw tonight. Uh, He does a great job of catching touchdowns. He is a red zone monster. But he drops a lot of balls. Uh, Even before tonight, he dropped 15% of his passes this year. That's, a, that's an alarming rate, and that goes back to last year as well. Big, fast, physical, smart, aggressive, uh, is turning into a good blocker. On Nick Singleton's screenplay, he took his, he took, it would look like a high school uh, highlight film where you have a receiver or a defensive back that just shoves his opponent out of the, onto the sideline because he's bigger and stronger and it's just laughably un- overmatched. So he's, he's dominating in certain situations, but dropping passes is a problem. And that is something where I, I think that um, if he can fix that, he becomes a complete tight end where we're talking difference maker in the NFL sort of skills that he has, the ability to catch and run and the ability to block. He can be a really, really, really good football player, but those... Those are starting to concern me. Those those drops are starting to concern me in terms of, I don't know that's going away from his profile. Now, there are tight ends in the NFL that are freaks that drop the football. And so you can live with that. But at the same time, he was dominant in this game. So if you're wondering, you know, in this particular situation, Nick Singleton on a pin and pull got into space. You know, why aren't we getting Nick Singleton, that athlete, into space if you're asking if you're a Penn State fan? The tight ends have struggled against good teams to get a key block in that in that system, like the pin, I've talked about this a thousand times. You want to check out T. Frank's film room? We'll show it to you there. The pin and pull, everyone looks at the pull blocks, right? So the guys, the big offensive linemen, the elephants running in space. 
but you have to pin the defensive end to spring everybody into space, including the offensive lineman. If you don't get that important block on the edge of the tackle box, none of that happens. The offensive linemen don't get into space. The running back doesn't get into space. And then you have a dead play. So they got to that. Why haven't they gotten to that as much this year? Why hasn't Singleton been in? Sp- that's why. That That's your answer. So getting consistent blocking from the tight ends. It was great this game. And you can see when they finally get all those things together, that's a situation where Penn State is able to show what they can do. Um, the concepts were always there. Penn State was still trying to do those things in different ways with Mike Yersich. It's just, you know, in this particular uh, game, Michigan State's pretty bad. Uh, another situation that I wanted to cover from the game, so, sort of an X's and O's thing we can uh, talk about here at the end of the show. The sack in the red zone, the offensive line issues early in the game. I genuinely don't know how uh, Penn State continues to give up the same pressure over and over and over and again. I'm not talking about the same sack. There were a couple of, so I'll talk about one of the sacks early in the game. There is a there is a defensive line game you can play that every team has used against Penn State and almost all of them have gotten a sack. It, you, you take usually a defensive tackle, the nose tackle, and you run him across the face of Hunter Norzad and he will take that guy. And then you loop, a, you loop a guy around him, and it's just free pressure. Just that action is just drop it in the bucket. Sack Drew Aller. I, I don't know how. I don't know how to fix it. I'm not an offensive line expert. But I can point to it and be like, hey, that's the same thing. I've seen that before. I've seen this movie. This is a rerun. Um, in the red zone. I don't put that one on the offensive line, though, because that was a cover zero pressure. So that means there are more defenders rushing the quarterback than there are pass protectors so you have to take the number one threat which is the most dangerous one so probably when we go back and look at film review the running back took the wrong guy but there were too many players the quarterback has to account for one of them and the coverage on that play there was no quick throw because Michigan State was in off coverage and then they also switched so they stayed on their side of the receiver Penn State was trying to run as I'll use my fancy diagramming here because I've got a whiteboard, which is just my hands. I'm very good at talking with my hands. So the tight ends are trying to run a rub route of some sort. And the corners just, they say, I'll take the guy on the outside, you take the guy on the inside, no matter what happens. So when they cross, nobody crosses with them. And because Aller's looking at that and he's not getting what he wants, he holds on the football. That's the actually looking at that play. That's the best possible outcome is he got a sack. He didn't get hurt and he didn't fumble the football. So in certain situations, some of the offensive line issues look worse for them than, uh, than actually, I think, the, the play. The play call itself didn't match what they were getting from the defense. So that's something that, um, that I, I think keep in mind when you're thinking about the Penn State offensive line. It's not all on them. Not every sack is on them. Um, Rockerfella says, I appreciate Norzad, but he ain't no juice. Um, What are you saying here? When Tyler moves on, T. Frank will be out on, uh, will be out only. Uh, I'm not understanding what you're saying here. I think I'm reading it wrong. I'll go back to this one. Appreciate Hunter Norzad, but he ain't no juice. Hunter Norzad is not as consistent as Juice Scruggs, but I don't know that other than Olu Fashinu, there's been a player that has that level of consistency. Juice was unbelievably consistent as a football player. So yeah, I would agree. Hunter Norzad has very high highs. He and J.B. Nelson, on the first play of the game, where I think J.B. Nelson got hurt, he sprinted to the second level and swallowed up a linebacker. And Hunter Norzad took a dude and threw him out of the club. So they had some unbelievably impressive run-blocking plays when you see, like, you know, you go down and you look at the individual details. Um, But play-to-play, he was not nearly as consistent as, uh, as Juice Scruggs. So... You know, different types of players, and clearly, Penn State, the consistency of a football player is more valuable than doing uh, really elite things, right? So, Hunter Norris that has some blocks that are just kind of, you, from a technical perspective, you go, wow, that was really hard to do, and he pulled it off. And maybe Juice wouldn't do those things, but he also wouldn't fail at 
falling off a block and and giving up an easy tackle for a loss. So I, I don't I don't know specifically why we're talking about that at, at this point, but I do think that it does characterize this offensive line, which you saw the the upside of them. They are big, they are physical, they move guys off the ball, and they can be dominant when when they uh when they're able to use their athleticism and they're not playing against uh teams that can play with strength and match them from a talent perspective. Because there are some technical things that uh weren't great. Vega Yuane, um and a couple of bad pass blocking snaps, you know, he's gotta get a little bit more he's gonna be a little bit more consistent uh in, in the run in the pass game if he's going to be a guy that takes over next. And that's something with this offensive line and this um, looking forward to next year. I would say receiver is the obvious red flag for the entire team. Fixing that and developing guys on the roster and fixing what's wrong at that position. Trying to go out and get guys that can come in and have an immediate impact. And we don't have the conversation of, oh, he's got to learn the offense or whatever. Like, no, 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 no. Receiver equals catches and threat outside. And that's the end of that conversation. A guy to come in and be a part of the offense and to be a reliable, stable, productive, dangerous threat. They, they got to get, they, whether internal or external, they got to do that. But then to me, the next question becomes, you're losing four-fifths of your offensive line. Now, you are returning Drew Shelton, Vega Ioane, J.B. Nelson. Three guys that have gotten extensive experience this year. But you're also replacing a top-five offensive tackle. Um, and then a couple veterans on the right side that, you know, I have not talked about Caden Wallace almost at all this year. And that's that's been a relief. <laughs> like, I'm very happy for him that he put in that time, and he's one of the rare offensive linemen that late in their career turns the corner and becomes a dependable, consistent player that does really good this year for Penn State. Not elite, not going to be a first-round pick, but I do think he's an NFL offensive lineman um, and somebody that uh, is somebody's going to get a steal in the middle rounds to late rounds with Caden Wallace. So you're replacing two really good tackles and a center. Is the next starting five, and we're just I'm going to give you what I think right now off the bat might be the starting five of Shelton at left tackle, Nelson at left guard, TBD at center. I, I should have done this in, on paper first. And then uh, you want at right guard and um, Javen Williams at right tackle. So you've got a big question mark at center and you got a freshman at right tackle. Can that group put Penn State on a situation to be comparable with their defense? Because the defense is returning enough talent, enough youth, that even if they have some rough spots, they're still going to have a strong unit. That's going to be the biggest determining factor between now and next year, is can you still provide Drew, uh, Drew Aller with a stable pocket more times than not? And fix, you know, that is the talent ready to arrive now? Because it's got to. All of that depth and the ability they have up front, that has to come to fruition pretty quickly. And we might be having a conversation about Anthony Donko playing a lot next year. So those young guys, it's <laughs> it's it's a quick turnaround for them as opposed to some of these guys like Drew Shelton who's had time to, um, you know, given that he did start for six games as a freshman, but this year has really been like the building blocks year for him to grow into the full-time, we actually meant for this to happen, starter at left tackle. You feel good about the potential there, but you still don't know. Is he going to be that level? Because he's got some real chops in the running game. Can he be the pass protector they need him to be? Because I do think they're going to get an aggressive offensive coordinator that wants to throw the football. Just my guess. Um, so then you, you, you're you hoping you have three tackles at all times. Do you have two? And so, once again, we're talking about Penn State needing some portal help there. So, receiver, offensive line, this story seems pretty familiar, right? Um, let's see what you guys got in the uh, in the chat here. I don't know. Again, I don't know exactly why we're talking about football, OSU, Michigan. Um, that's not super interesting. Yeah, seems like you guys have as much to talk about as I do at this point. So, perfect. 
An hour in, we nailed it. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. This has been the BWI Live postgame show. Once again, if you want to subscribe, get all the information, all the big things that are going to change. Portal Talk, we just started that today. That's going to be heating up. BlueWhiteIllustrated.com, $1 for two months. Use code PSU1 to get that offer in. I put a link to sign up in the chat. So if you check that out, that'll take you to where you can sign up to Blue White Illustrated. I'm Thomas Frank Carr, and you have been awesome all season long. Thank you to everybody who's contributed. There are literally too many regulars for me to name right here. I know that you know who you are. So thank you for being a part of the Blue White Illustrated live show. The postgame show returns for the bowl game. When we find out who that is, when that is, uh, we'll let you know all that information. And uh, as always, we'll be going live immediately after the game. So Penn State wins 42 to nothing. A feel-good send-off, a... a Ending on a positive note, finishing strong, coach speak, coach speak. We will talk to you on Tuesday with the BWI Live Show as we recap this game and look ahead to the next part of Penn State's offseason where they've got to get some work done in recruiting. That's all heating up next with Penn State football. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. We'll talk to you then.